The Lord be with you. And also with you. Welcome to our worship service this evening. This is our uh, midweek of Lent 2 service. Tonight we're going to be focused on Malchus. And if you're wondering who Malchus is, well, you've come to the right place, because that's who we're going to talk about and find out about tonight. So all four Gospels record the event in Gethsemane when the ear of the high priest's servant is cut off. Only John gives us names, Peter and Malchus. Our attention now is drawn to Gethsemane, that night when Judas betrays Jesus, as Peter cuts off the ear of Malchus. The chief priests, scribes, Judas, and Peter all seek power and control of the situation. Jesus, the only one with true power and authority, lays it down, as he also does with his life itself. In his resurrection, Jesus will take up his life again, reclaiming his power, control, and authority, which extends throughout the earth and heavens. We rise for our opening sentences this evening. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our salvation. We continue with the psalmody for this evening. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Save me, O God. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. But I come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My throat dim with waiting for you, God. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. An unacceptable child, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. Deliver me from the sinking in the mire. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Draw near to my soul, redeem me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your mercy, turn to me. We take a time of silence for reflection on God's word. God of hope, in Christ's Passover from death to life, you have restored your fallen creation and raised up to life a people marked for death. Fill us with thanksgiving that we, who by the rescue of your grace have been made new, may delight in your ways. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We sing our first hymn of the evening, Behold the Lamb of God, John said.
may be seated for our readings this evening. Our first reading is from Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. O Lord, have mercy on us. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians, the first chapter. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is in Corinth, and with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. And a reading from St. John, the 18th chapter. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. We continue with the responsory. Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. In you, O Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not, O Lord my God. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. We continue with our next song.
grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. On January 17, 2004, a 66-ton sperm whale died and was beached on the southwestern coast of Taiwan. Two weeks later, moving at the speed of government, the authorities decided to truck the dead whale to a laboratory where they could do an autopsy. And it took 50 men and three lifting cranes 13 hours to hoist the whale onto a flatbed trailer. People poured into the streets of a local city to watch the spectacle of a whale carcass being driven through their downtown. And then it happened. As the truck crawled through the city with crowds looking on, the whale exploded. That's correct. The whale exploded. I did not know that whales could explode, but this guy sure did. So the insides of the whale splattered cars, people, and local shops. (laughs) Traffic, as you can imagine, stopped for a few hours. And the smell, well, I'm certain it was almost, if not completely, unbearable. And you can probably guess that No one saw that coming. (laughs) And why would you? We're just moving a 66-ton whale through our downtown. What's the worst? And you know, somebody asked, what's the worst that could happen? A whale exploding in your downtown. That's the worst that could happen. But that's the problem, right? Like, sometimes life is just like that sometimes. We're going about our business. We're going about our day-to-day lives. We're doing the things that we normally do. And right in the middle of our tidy, ordered world, a whale explodes. And we're left hurt, and we're left confused, and we've got lots of questions that begin with this word. Why? Why did she leave me? Why did he have to die? Why did we lose so much money? Why does our daughter continue to cause us so much pain? Why, why, and why? Tonight, we continue our sermon series called Witnesses to Christ. And tonight, we come to John 18, and we meet Malchus. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Malchus was going about his business, and before he knows it, it was as though a whale exploded. Suddenly, his right ear was cut off by a random fisherman from Galilee. And if you would have asked Malchus that day, how's your day going to go today, Malchus? I guarantee you he didn't say, some random Galilean fisherman is going to cut my ear off later tonight. That's not on his calendar of things to do, right? It's not on the sundial for that day. No one saw it coming. And so the crowd collects. And as we heard, now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And so the band, or the cohort tonight, are Roman soldiers. And of course, Roman soldiers will come into the picture on the next day of, as we move through the Gospels on to Good Friday. And Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Peter cuts off Malchus's right ear. The crowd collects and the chaos commences. And for Malchus, that's when the whale in the middle of his life exploded. So has a mess suddenly appeared in your own life? Are you doing just everything you can to survive? Have you consulted the bank? Have you changed your diet? Have you called an attorney? Have you tightened your budget? Have you gone into counseling or rehab or therapy? And if you have, don't give up. Don't be afraid to ask for help if you need it. And don't give up because the control is clear. And whose control? It's Christ's control. Judas, the Jews, and the Romans appear to be running things in our text for tonight. But they only appear to be running things tonight. Christ is the one who is really in control. And how do we know that? While our text continues, Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward. The control is very clear. When his enemies come, Christ goes out to meet them. When Judas approaches, Christ doesn't run. 
When Peter strikes Malchus, Christ commands Peter to put away his sword. And then Jesus says this, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. From John chapter 10. And though the powers of darkness rise against Christ, full throttle, Christ is in control. Matthew's gospel tells us at this point, Jesus could ask his father for more than 12 legions of angels. Well, how many people are in a legion? What's 12 legions worth of angels going to be? At that time, there were 6,000 men in one Roman legion. So if we do the math and run the numbers, we've got 12 legions by 6,000 people. That'd be 72,000 angels or two moose jaws worth of angels. But Christ doesn't need 72,000 angels because Christ is in control. During World War II, psychologists compared ground troops with fighter pilots. They determined that after 60 days of continuous combat, the anxiety of ground troops was off the charts. After 60 days, though, an astounding 93% of fighter pilots were happy and at peace. Why is that? Did the fighter pilots know that all the good World War II movies would be made about them? Were Eagles there? The Battle of Britain? Did they know that? No, of course not. They felt better because they had more control. They had their hands on the throttle. They had their hands on the stick. They know when they're going up. They know where they're going up. The radar tells them, especially at that time, if you were in Britain, radar had just been developed, so they've got a huge advantage over the, the German Luftwaffe because it's like before radar, you just kind of like, oh, look, there's airplanes up above. With radar, you turn on your screen, you're like, oh, hey, there's airplanes like 10 miles away. Let's go meet them. Let's go have some fun, boys. But for ground troops, it's a different story, right? You don't have radar, especially not at that time. You don't even have night vision at World War II. You're out there on your own. And so they felt forlorn and helpless. And they could just be as easily killed just standing there, right? My World War II snipers have become a, a much bigger part of warfare um, and these sorts of things. And so they just feel more hopeless because they don't know when or where the attack is going to come from. Like, if they're lucky, they'll get to hear the tanks a couple miles off. If they're lucky, they'll get to hear the screaming Stukas on a dive bomb approach. If they're lucky, they might hear the command to charge their formation. And so what's the point of all of this then? Well, popular wisdom tells us, always seek control. And we don't need a war to prove it either. All we need is a backup on our highways. A team of German researchers recently found that a traffic jam triples a chance of having a heart attack. Can't imagine why there's anyone still left in LA if that's the case, but all right. <laughs> you know, that's why we're so healthy here in Saskatchewan, generally speaking. Our traffic jams are like a few minutes long, but I can't imagine. Like the 401, like you look at the 401 in, in Ontario and you're like, why would you live like that? Of course, they go to all kinds of concerts and all kinds of fancy restaurants and stuff and they look at me and they're like, why would you live like that? I'm like, yeah, fair enough, you know. And this is why I don't get calls to that part of the country, by the way, just in case you were wondering. It's like, Pastor Rod, would you ever go to Toronto? I'm like, I don't think they would like me there. I think I'm a little redneck just for that sort of thing. Anyways, back to the task at hand. We're always told to seek control, right? Like that's kind of the game plan, right? If you listen to self-help gurus or anything of that nature, what's the plan? Get control or get back control or take control. If you're training for a sport, what's the thing? Get control of the ball and then keep control of the ball, right? If you're training for a fight, it's keep control of the rhythm, keep control of the pace. If you're writing a book or doing any sort of work, you know, better be under control. But what's the plan then when a whale explodes? What are we going to do with that? If we follow the popular wisdom, all we seek control, well, we're already behind. The whale's already blown up. And now what? You know, and we, and we try, right? We try to always seek control. Never board a plane without a parachute. Never leave the house without a gas mask. Never step on a crack lest you break your mother's back. Never go to a rider's game without a bottle of Pilsner handy, right? Like, always be prepared. Always be in control. 
control. That's it. And so we face every exploding whale by taking control. There's only one problem with this popular wisdom, however, is that it doesn't work. Would you like something that does work, however? And this is going to be hard because we're not very good at this. But rather than seek control, relinquish control. Give it all up. Let go. Resign as the CEO of the universe. Give your entire mess, whatever it is, to Jesus. Because Christ's control is clear. And his calm is contagious as well. The scriptures say this in John chapter 18. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Christ is calm because he trusts the scriptures. And Christ's calm is contagious. In a penis comic strip, Lucy is struggling with her Sunday school memory verse. And finally, she suggests that maybe it's a verse from the book of reevaluations, as opposed to the book of revelations. We need a reevaluation of our situation here. And indeed, the scriptures are a book of reevaluations. They help us to reevaluate who really is in control. And we go back to John chapter 1. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christ is in control of sin and he takes it all away. John 4. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Christ is in control of our aching thirst and he quenches it with his unconditional love. In John 8. I am the light of the world. Christ is in control of darkness. And he is the light of the world. If you've ever sent your kids or grandkids off to camp, you know they, you have to sign a form that asks this important question. Who is the responsible party? Who gets the phone call? If Johnny breaks his arm or Susie breaks out with the measles, who are we calling to come pick him up? And so a parent signs his or her name. And Christ signed his name for us. And he wrote it in his own blood. When we were baptized, Jesus took full responsibility for us. When the whale explodes, Jesus is the responsible party, not us. It's his job to see us through. Christ is his shepherd, and we are the sheep. Christ is the bridegroom, and we are the bride. Christ is the rabbi, and we are the disciples. And we say, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And his calm is contagious because he is the responsible party. And whether we care to admit it or not, one of three things is probably happening in our lives right now. We are either heading for a mess, or we are in a mess, or we just went through a mess. But no matter which of those three scenarios that we find ourselves in, we don't have to become hopeless or anxious or faithless because Christ is with us. Christ has signed his name as the responsible party for us. And Christ has given us a place to go when the whale finally explodes. He gives us his home here in his church to call us into his presence to bring our prayers and petitions to him, to extend to us his word and his sacrament, to reach out and to calm your spirit. And he does that for you. You can imagine that Malchus would have had a fair bit of anxiety at having his right ear cut off. The medicine of that day is not up for cochlear implants and those sorts of things, right? He's not going to get that. But what does he get? Christ's healing hand reaching out and restoring his ear. And no matter what happens to us in our life, Christ's healing hand is there upon us. And while it is true that some of the healing we will not see in all of its fullness until eternity, that doesn't make it any less true. It doesn't make it any less potent. And we know that Christ is always with us in the midst of everything that we go through, just as he was in Scripture just as he has been through church history, and just as he is tonight through the words that we are hearing uh, from the scripture. And it's in the midst of these exploding whales 
that Christ comes and gives us peace. And Christ comes and gives you peace. He gives you the peace of the Holy Spirit and the promise of the life everlasting. And because of that, we say, even though we may be covered in whale guts, thanks be to God. And now the peace of Christ, which surpasses, or the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us rise for our prayers this evening. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For behold, from this day all generations will call me blessed. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has exalted the lowly. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. We continue with our next song.
We rise for the Kyrie Lord's Prayer and Collects of this evening. Uh, in our prayers this evening, we're going to recall uh, Tammy's grandma, Jessie Matrick, who had a stroke uh, near the end of last week. So, Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, ruler of all things and God of all consolation, your Son healed every manner of infirmity and disease, and so displayed your mercy toward the sick and the suffering. Mercifully come to the aid of your servants, especially Elvira Keller, Sean Brown, Chase Bradshaw, Colleen King, Don Lockhart, Judy Koval, Stacy and Colleen Anweiler, Colleen Iverson, Brett Smith, Lorene Waldbelig, Linda Federspiel, Bennett Slater, Deanna and Norm Weimer, and Jesse Matchett that according to your merciful will, they may be delivered from illness, restored to health, strengthened in faith, and offer you the thanks and praise of a grateful heart. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Deliver us, O Lord, from temptation to manage and control the troubles and uncertainties of this mortal life, and grant us faith in you, that our peace may not come from the things around us, but from the grace and mercy you have manifested upon the cross once for all. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, from whom all come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We sing our closing song. Thank you. 
one who calls upon his name, they will be saved, they will be saved. Anyone who calls upon his name, they will be saved, they will be saved. Thanks everyone for playing and singing tonight. Thanks John for running the PowerPoint tonight. My dear Christian friends, Christ has reached out his hand to you through his word. He has restored you to himself. Your sins are forgiven and the kingdom of heaven is yours. Knowing this, you can go in peace. <laughs>